everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's virtual public meeting for the Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge proposed expansion. We are going to give folks a few minutes here to join the meeting, and then we'll begin the PowerPoint presentation shortly, so please stay tuned. I do want to note that closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcript button on your Zoom toolbar and then selecting show subtitles. Thank you everyone for your patience as we wait for folks to join. Again, welcome everyone to today's meeting. We're going to give folks a few more minutes to join the meeting, so please stay tuned and we'll start the presentation shortly. Again, I do want to note that closed captioning is available by clicking the live transcript button on your Zoom toolbar and then selecting show subtitles. Thank you everyone for your patience as we give folks a few more minutes to join. Next slide, please. Hello again. We're going to go ahead and get started with our meeting today. I would like to thank you all for joining us. We appreciate your time and participation. My name is Megan Stone, and I'm a contractor for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm going to be one of your meeting facilitators today. Additionally, I have several members of the service with me on the meeting tonight, will be introduced in a moment. Our expected agenda for the day is up on the screen. I'll briefly go over an orientation to Zoom and some ground rules for today's meeting. Then we'll have Matt Connolly, Refuge Manager, provide opening remarks and introduce the team. The service will then provide a PowerPoint presentation, which will last approximately 30 minutes. After that, we'll move into a question and answer session where the service will answer any questions you may have about the draft land protection plan and environmental assessment. We'll do that Q&A for about 30 minutes. And for the remainder of the meeting, we will accept verbal public comments. Next slide, please. Before we get started with the presentation, I'll go over some ground rules for the meeting. First, this meeting is being recorded as part of the project record, and a recording will be posted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website. Please note it does take a little bit of time to get that recording up, as we do need to make it accessible for all. Second, your microphones and videos will be turned off for the duration of the meeting. You will only be unmuted if and when I unmute you during the question and answer session, or the verbal public hearing. Third, questions will be addressed during the Q&A session after the PowerPoint presentation. We will do our best to address questions in the order they come in to allow everyone an opportunity to voice their questions today. If you submitted a question as part of reg registration, there's no need to submit that question again. We'll start with those questions first today. After that, we'll move on to the public comment portion, during which we will accept verbal public comments from participants who have joined today's meeting. If you registered before the start time of today's meeting and indicated that you wanted to offer a verbal public comment, you are on our list of pre-registered commenters. We will call on those who indicated they wanted to or potentially wanted to provide a comment in the order of registration. If you registered after the meeting started, we'll do our best to reserve some time for you to have an opportunity to offer your verbal public comment today. 
If you do not get the opportunity to offer your verbal public comment today, written public comments can be submitted via email and we have that email up on the screen and we'll go ahead and paste that in the chat as well. Comments can be submitted through January 4th, 2024. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Matt Connolly, Refuge Manager for opening remarks. Yes, thank you, Megan. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your interest in the proposed expansion of the Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge. As Megan said, I'm Matt Connolly, the manager for the Roanoke River Wildlife Refuge, and with me is Gene Richter, the wildlife biologist for the, for the refuge. And uh, we're glad that you all took the time out of your day to attend to this little uh, webinar. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the um, Fish and Wildlife Service and the Wildlife Refuge System. Uh, the first refuge was created in 1903 by Teddy, President Teddy Roosevelt. Um, it was the Pelican Island Wildlife Refuge in Florida. Today we have over 588 National Wildlife Refuge. We protect 856 million acres. There's a refuge in every state, at least one refuge in every state, and some U.S. territories. And we have over 67 million visitors per year. Next slide, please. So this just uh, is a map to show the distribution of the wildlife refuges um, in the continental United States and Alaska. Um, you can see a lot of the refuges are concentrated on the coasts. Um, we are part of our responsibility as migratory birds and waterfowl. And so um, refuges are placed in areas that are frequented by migratory birds and waterfowl. Next slide, please. So um, a little bit about um, how we operate National Wildlife Refuges. In 1997, we had a major piece of legislation passed, the Refuge System Improvement Act. And um, the statement of, the, of that act was to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation and management and where appropriate restoration of fish and wildlife, uh, plant resources and their habitats uh, for the benefit and the present and future generations of America. And that's the part I'd like to uh, highlight to you all. Um, these are places that are uh, for the public and uh, for their enjoyment and, um, uh, and for their recreation. Next slide, please. So typically we have um, six public uses that are uh, priority for wildlife refuges. They include hunting, fishing, environmental education, wildlife observation, interpretation, and wildlife photography. Um, these uh, uses have to be compatible with the purpose that the, that particular refuge was established for them to be authorized for the, for, to occur on a refuge. And so um, these are not the only public uses that can occur in a refuge, but every use that happens on a refuge has to be deemed compatible for the purposes by which that refuge was established. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the Roanoke River and the Roanoke River Basin. It's uh, 442 miles long with 9,875 square miles of drainage. Um, and if you look at the map, most of the drainage area is in um, the western part of Virginia. And um, that's going to become important for us um, as we go along in this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So uh, the Roanoke River is um, one of the largest, most intact bottomland hardwood forest communities left on the eastern coast of the United States. It is... Um, Large components are um, hardwood forest communities, tupelo cypress forests, and mature stands of pines. Um, it's a habitat for many different species. Next slide. So um, one of the primary features of the Roanoke, it's habitat for migratory waterfowl, such as mallards, wood ducks. Next slide. It has one of the largest populations of wild turkey in North Carolina. Next slide, please. 
There are several active heron rookeries up and down the river. <clears throat> Next slide. It's important for migratory neotropical birds like um, Swainson's warbler, Kentucky warbler. It's important for various um, raptor species like Mississippi kite or um, bald eagle. Um, and it's, uh, it's critical for a lot of these birds that are um, forest obligates where they need uh, large tracts of forested lands. Next slide, please. It's also important as a place for uh, migratory fish, um, especially um, alewife, American eel, American shad, Atlantic sturgeon, blueback herring. herring. Um, they all utilize the, um, the Roanoke River as a place where they either spawn or they grow and then spawn in the ocean. Next slide, please. Alrighty, so um, here we can see the um, current boundaries of the of the Roanoke River Wildlife Refuge. The areas in green on your map are areas that we actually own in fee title. Um, the areas that are outlined in green are areas that are within our current acquisition boundary, but we don't yet own. The refuge was established in 1989 to protect and conserve migratory birds and other wildlife resources through the protection of wetlands. The Roanoke River flows through an extensive floodplain of national significance. This forested wetland area is considered to be the largest intact and least disturbed bottomland hardwood forest ecosystem remaining in the mid-Atlantic region. And that's um, based on North Carolina Nar National Heritage Program. Some of the best examples of brown water river floodplain ecological communities are present in this system. Next slide, please. Okay, in this slide, we can see um, the relationship of the Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge to the other refuges that are to the east of us, um, closer to the outer, um, outer banks. So we have um, Pea Island, which is actually not in this slide, but is part of the outer banks, Alligator River, Coast and Lakes Wildlife Refuge, and Manna Mesquite and Swan Quarter. Um, Roanoke River is part of a coastal North Carolina um, National Wildlife Refuge Complex, um, which is, encompasses over 400,000 acres. Um, next slide, please. So as we look at this slide, this is a, um, a bathtub model of what would happen if we had a meter of sea level rise over the next 80 to 100 years. So this does not account for um, any breaches in the Outer Banks or anything like that. Just if the sea level were to rise a meter in, in elevation over the next 100 years, this is the impacts that we would have on the landscape. Now, um, I don't want to alarm folks because it looks like all of that area becomes open water, which is not the case. What this um, model is showing that sometime during the tidal cycle, either um, at high tide or maybe mid tide, these areas that have been shaded in blue are gonna be impacted by sea level rise. Next slide, please. So here we can see um, a more concentrated view of sea level rise impacts to the lower Roanoke River. Um, as salinity levels rise, we expect that these habitats which are now forested wetlands to gradually change into open marsh or, or, or salt marsh. Next slide, please. So this is a slide of uh, projected urban growth up to um, the year 2100. So on the slide that's to the bottom um, right of your screen, that is the slide of projected urban growth for the year 2100. That area in blue is our uh, project focus area. And as you can see, um, it remains relatively undeveloped into the foreseeable future. And it provides a perfect corridor for wildlife to escape the effects of sea level rise and find higher ground. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so here is, um, we'll talk about water control on the Roanoke River. We have three dams that are at, on, on the river. We have Car Lake Dam, Gaston Lake Dam, and then the dam at Roanoke Rapids. Um, so the, Rona, the dam at Car Lake is a dam that is run by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it is a flood control dam. Its purpose is to uh, provide protection from floods on the lower Roanoke River. And remember, we talked about how the um, the vast part of the watershed of the Roanoke River is in the mountains of Virginia. Therefore, if we get um, significant rainfall in that portion of the country, the, the mountains of Western Virginia, um, we're gonna see a, a high rise in the water level for us in the Roanoke downstream because all that water is flowing into Car Lake and has to be released from Car Lake Dam. Okay, next slide. So currently, um, the Army Corps is authorized to release a maximum of 35,000 cubic feet per second from their dam spillway. Um, this footprint of an extended release of say seven to 10 days of 35,000 uh, cubic feet per second of water from Car Lake Dam is the footprint that we used to create our conservation partnership area. Next slide, please. So the service proposed um, three different alternatives, well, actually four different alternatives for this um, project. We have the no action or the status quo alternative where actually nothing happens. We also have our proposed action, which would be to create a 287,000 90 acre conservation partnership area um, that would be up and down the Roanoke River and the Kashai. We have an alternative C, which is um, 195,000 acres, and then alternative D, which is 205,000 acres. And I'll get into those alternatives as we go along. The thing that, about all of these alternatives is that the service is limited to um, acquiring 50,000 acres in fee title, which means that the U.S. government owns that property, and up to 100,000 acres in conservation easements or other conservation agreements. Next slide, please. So here we can see the three different alternatives. Um, so alternative C, um, which is our um, alternative that um, Yeah, pardon? Yeah, the preferred alternative is B. Um, alternative D focuses on the expansion of the northern reach of the Roanoke River from Williamston north to the dam at Roanoke Rapids. It incorporates a wildlife corridor um, extending south to Pocosin Lakes. The alternative B, which is our preferred alternative, would approximate the 100-year floodplain of the Roanoke River from the Albemarle Sound to the dam at Roanoke Rapids. It provides additional protection to, for the Kashai River and lands south of Windsor and creates a corridor from the Roanoke River Wildlife Refuge towards the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide is a slide that shows our conservation partnership area with uh, hatched in this gray color um, with the existing lands that are already in conservation status highlighted in um, the other colors. So the green color is the existing Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge. The kind of purplish color are um, wildlife resource conservation game lands and the brownish color are uh, properties that are in um, non-governmental organizations like the Nature Conservancy. Um, these lands uh, that are currently already in conservation status within the conservation partnership area total approximately 100,000 acres. Next slide, please. 
So this sh slide shows our preferred alternative with um, our priority acquisitions. So as you can see, the area in red is the area of highest priority for our acquisitions. Um, lands prioritized by location and significance to wildlife. Priorities will drive both expenditures of acquisition funds and whether properties are acquired in easement or fee title. So the area in red, which is our, um, our highest priority, is the area extends from um, the Highway 17 bridge at Williamston um, upstream to the Roanoke Rapids Dam at Weldon. Um, the area is basically the 35,000 CFS footprint right on the river, and it is our highest priority for acquisition and for easements. The area in yellow represents our second highest priority. Those are areas that are adjacent to um, the river, uh, but a little bit more distant than the 35,000 footprint, as well as the corridor that leads to Pocosin Lakes Wildlife Refuge. Um, the lowest priority are those areas that are downstream from Williamston that are going to be, and up the Kashai, that are going to be impacted by sea level rise in the future. Next slide, please. So this plan fits right in with the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission um, plan for protection of habitats along um, the Roanoke and um, the eastern part of North Carolina. Next slide, please. Um, this slide is demonstrating that um, our project is very similar to other projects that have been proposed by the Fish and Wildlife Service in other areas. It has a high concentration of um, conservation through um, easements and cooperative agreements. Next slide, please. So the question is, what does fee title mean? So fee title is actually... Um, the government purchases the property outright, and that piece of property becomes part of the Roanoke River National Wildlife Refuge, just like the properties that we have today. So folks would be able to access those properties um, to recreate on. They would be able to hunt or fish um, according to the way we manage the current lands in the, in the refuge currently. Um, if we have a conservation easement, um, what that is, is a, some kind of limit to what you can do on your property. So for example, you have a piece of property that is 70 acres, um, or a hundred acres, say 70 acres of that is agricultural or, um, pine farm or pine plantation and 30 acres is bottomland hardwood forest. The service might approach you and say, we'd like to put an easement on the 30 acres that is the bottomland hardwood forest. And that easement might say um, that you cannot cut timber on that, on that part of the property, or perhaps the easement would say, you can cut timber there, but you have to have an approved uh, management um, agreement for how to cut that timber. And um, you would still, the, the service would give you a one-time payment for that easement and then that easement would remain on that property in perpetuity. So if you were to sell your property to someone else in the future, that easement would go along with that property and the new landowner would have to abide by the regulations that were put onto that easement. Next slide, please. So what are the potential funding sources for um, this project? We have the Land and Water Conservation Fund. This money is derived from collecting offshore oil and gas leases. We have Migratory Bird Conservation Fund. Primarily, this is from the sale of federal duck stamps and other equipment that's used in hunting of waterfowl. We have the North American Wetlands Conservation Fund. This is an appropriation that goes through uh, Congress. It comes from fines and penalties, forfeiture, forfeitures for migratory Bird Treaty Act violations, um, excise tax, um, sport and recreation um, uh, purchases, and that kind of thing. Next slide, please. So the big question is, what does this mean to you? Um, so 
you can still hunt and fish on your land. You can do whatever you want on your land as you currently do right now. You may keep or sell your land to anyone you choose, just like now. However, if your piece of property falls within our conservation partnership area, you have the option to also sell your property to the Fish and Wildlife Service or an easement. Uh, in an example, if you had an adjacent property owner whose property was outside of the conservation partnership area, we couldn't, we couldn't offer them an easement or we couldn't buy their property. Even if they wanted to give us their property, we couldn't accept it because it's not within our conservation partnership uh, boundary. Um, so if you are actually within the boundary, now you have the option to sell to the Fish and Wildlife Service or to enter into a conservation agreement or a easement. Next slide, please. Okay, how does this affect what we do on your property? Um, so the first thing I like to say right off the bat is the service is only going to deal with willing sellers. There's not going to be any condemnation of any land. There's not going to be any um, kind of uh, strong arm tactics to force you to sell your land. We only want to deal with willing sellers. So if um, you don't want to sell to us and you don't want to have an easement on your property, nothing happens at all. However, if you do, you have the option, if you're within the conservation partnership area, you have the option to deal with the Fish and Wildlife Service and sell your property or sell a conservation easement. Um, now, if you put a conservation easement on your property to protect it for timber harvest, that doesn't mean that you can't still hunt and fish on your property. You can't still a lease your property to hunters to hunt and fish. Um, it just means that you just can't cut timber. Next slide, please. So the question always comes up, will the federal government be um, taking my land through eminent domain? Um, that is not going to happen. As I said, we are only dealing with willing sellers. There is no... Um, there's no um, a condemnation of land. If, if your neighbor sells um, his property to the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, but you don't, it, we have no effect. We have no authority to change how you deal with um, your property and what you do on it. However, there is a caveat that if your neighbor sells his property or you have property that is adjacent to the National Wildlife Refuge, um, it may increase your property value. Next slide. Again, will the service acquire land through eminent domain? No. The service will use no adverse action to take land from landowners. This, um, this language has been incorporated into the plan and um, there is going, there is no act, action that we will take um, to take your land. We will only deal with willing sellers. Next slide, please. Okay, so what about hunting and fishing? Um, you have the rights to hunt and fish on your property, um, and it's not the fact that you're within the conservation partnership area doesn't affect those rights at all. Um, you can still lease your property uh, for use by others. Um, current laws, regulations regarding hunting and fishing will still apply to your property. If you choose to sell it to us and it becomes part of the Fish and Wildlife, uh, the Roanoke River Wildlife Refuge, then um, that property will, will be entered into the um, Wildlife Resource Commission Permit Hunt Program just like all the other tracts of land in the refuge currently. Um, and so the general public will be able to um, apply for permits to hunt on the property. Um, that becomes part of the wildlife refuge system. If you sell a, um, an easement to the Fish and Wildlife Service, you still own that property. Um, the public will not have access to your land um, and you will be able to lease it out to anyone you want for hunting and fishing if you so desire. Next slide, please. 
Okay, a big question that comes up is the loss of tax revenues uh, for the various counties. Um, the the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, is uh, is part of a program called Refuge Revenue Sharing Act, which allows us to offset the tax losses um, to the counties by paying an annual fee um, to those, which often or sometimes um, exceeds the amount of taxes that would be collected um, if that land was in private ownership. Um, we've made um, revenue sharing taxes, uh, revenue sharing payments to Bertie County since the refuge has been established. Next slide, please. So um, these, these, um, these payments that are sent to uh, the counties in lieu of taxes, um, they use this uh, formula, three quarters of 1% of the fair market value or 25% of the net receipts collected or products or services on the land or 75% per acre. A lot of times um, this uh, value is gonna um, fluctuate. So next slide, please. So here we can see um, the values for um, revenue sharing that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has paid to Bertie County. You can see the acreage has stayed the same at 20,500 uh, acres. The value, the assessed value has been the same at 27,750,000. Um, the payments have changed over the years um, and that's a result of um, the amount of money that's in the fund for the revenue sharing plus the amount of money that Congress allocates uh, for this fund. So um, this, this um, number fluctuates um, on year to year based on how much money is allocated by Congress for these payments. Next slide, please. So where does the money for these payments come from? Well, it comes from different kinds of things. Um, activities that happen on refuges that um, generate um, revenue, such as timber sales, grazing fees, right of way permits, those kind of things. They go into the general fund that supplies money for this revenue sharing. Um, payments are made um, on the fair market value of the land. Um, so if you have um, some kind of like a, a farming thing that gives you um, a reduced tax burden for the county, uh, we don't base our um, revenue sharing on that reduced tax burden. We base our revenue sharing on the full market value of the land. Next slide, please. So here we're talking about the economic impacts of national wildlife refuges. There are 67 million people that have visited national wildlife refuges. These visits generate $3.2 billion in sales. And the best part is that 83% of these expenditures are by visitors that are outside of your counties. Okay. Um, this money um, is spent or generated by um, sales in, um, in um, lodging, in food, and things, uh, um, things they buy, knickknacks, that kind of stuff. And 72% uh, of the spending was on recreation that was non-consumptive. So they're not actually, he, um, folks that are visiting, they're not actually um, just hunters or fishermen that are taking um, game or fish. Um, they're bird watchers, they're hikers, they're people that wanna see the refuge, see the land around you, and they're spending their money in your communities. Next slide, please. So some more facts about fish and wildlife payments. Um, North Carolina lands are assessed on present use, which may qualify, this is what I was saying before, um, for a reduced tax bill, but we pay our revenue sharing based on the uh, full market value. Um, assessments on service land, owned lands will change just like assessments happen on your local property. So as the tax rolls changes, um, the value of our property say increases, we pay a higher um, we pay a higher revenue sharing payment. Next slide, please. 
So um, the service periodically does uh, regional refuge economic impacts for various refuges. Um, there's 588 refuges currently in the system. And to do these kind of economic impact studies um, takes a lot of time and effort. Um, the last time that they did them for re refuges that were here in Eastern or North Carolina were, were in 2011. Um, the one thing I want to draw your um, your eye to is that for every dollar that the uh, U.S. government spent on the Alligator River Wildlife Refuge, uh, 31 cents was generated. Every dollar that the re refuge, uh, the government spent on Pea Island Wildlife Refuge, $25,000 was generated. For every dollar that was spent on Pocosin Lakes Wildlife Refuge, $2.21. So the public is getting a great deal, uh, a great economic deal from, from um, national wildlife refuges. Um, the amount of money that we spend to manage these refuges is almost always offset by a higher number of uh, generation in the local community. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps? Uh, the first thing I like to say is that this is a proposal. We are presenting this information to you, the public, to solicit your input. You have up until um, January 4th to submit any comments on the plan. And those, those comments will be addressed as we re revise the plan to its final uh, format. Um, suggestions, questions uh, are helpful and welcome and appreciated. And all the comments that you make here on this webinar that you send by email will be incorporated into the plan. And hopefully we'll have that plan finished by uh, February of next year. Next slide, please. So here we are, we're, we're getting ready for questions. I'm gonna turn this over to Megan and she's gonna give you some information about how to submit questions or how to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and thank you for that presentation. Hello again, everyone. My name is Megan Stone, and I'll be the moderator for the Q&A session today. We'll now begin that session. The intent of the Q&A session is to answer any substantive questions you have for the service on the draft LPP and EA. If you submitted your question via the registration page, please note that you will not need to resubmit that question. We will start with those questions. But first, I'll go over instructions for how to submit a question using the chat function if you're on the Zoom web platform or Zoom app with us today. After we've gone through those instructions, I'll also explain how you can submit a question if you're on the phone. Next slide, please. So at this time, if you have a question and you are using the Zoom web platform or Zoom app, please go ahead and click on the chat icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom screen, the chat icon should appear. You may need to exit your full screen view in Zoom to see the chat icon. I've included a graphic on the left side of the screen here. That's where you can find the chat icon. Once you have that open, you can then type your question in the chat box and send it to hosts and panelists. I'll then read the question aloud for all participants to hear, and a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service team member will respond to your question aloud. We will try to answer your questions in the order that they're received, and we'll do our best to respond to all of the substantive questions we received today. Again, Please save any comments you have for the verbal public comment portion of today's meeting, which we'll have directly after this Q&A. So on the right side of the screen here, you can see how to um, submit a question if you're a phone caller. I don't see that we have any phone callers on, but just in case, if you are joining us by phone and you'd like to ask a question, please press star nine to raise your hand to let us know you have a question. When it's your turn, I'll identify you by the last four digits of your phone number. I'll then unmute you so that you can ask your question. And again, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service team member will respond to your question aloud. 
You may be muted on your end. If that is the case, we'll prompt you to unmute yourself by pressing star six. And we'll continue to leave these instructions up throughout the question and answer session. And please do note that there may be a pause between you chatting your question and us answering. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our first pre-registered question, which is, which partners are you working with to acquire land? How do those transactions proceed? And we'll turn that over to Matt. Okay, great question. So typically we work with um, um, a small group of partners for land acquisition. Um, one of the primary ones would be the Nature Conservancy. Another uh, primary um, partner with us would be the Conservation Fund and the Wildlife Resources Conservation. Um, so typically what would happen is because the um, government moves at such a slow pace and that um, a lot of people who want to sell their properties want to do that fairly quickly, um, we'll ask one of our partners, such as the Nature Conservancy, to put in an offer uh, for us. Um, so the, the Nature Conservancy would uh, go to you as a landowner and say, you know, I'm representing the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They have an interest in purchasing or your property or purchasing an easement on your property. And the sale would proceed through the Nature Conservancy. Afterwards, um, the Nature Conservancy would um, hold that property in their possession until funds were developed or our processes got got through. And then we would purchase that property uh, or that easement from the Nature Conservancy and it would become part of the refuge system. Thank you, Matt. We'll move on to our next pre-registered question, which is going to be one second here while I pull that up. Great. Our next pre-registered question is, can you tell us more about opportunities to partner with the Fish and Wildlife Service to fortify conservation education slash demonstration on my land? And we'll turn that over to you, Matt. Okay, thank you, Megan. Another great question. Um, yeah, we're always happy to field any questions about uh, folks who want to um, do conservation on their private land. Um, the best way to uh, do that would be to contact us through the um, the email link that's on our web on our website. Um, you can send your questions here, um, depending on where your property is. Um, if it's in the CPA, then we can um, talk about. Um, those kind of um, possibilities with you in person. Um, if they're outside of the CPA in another part of the state, uh, we'll make sure that we refer your question to someone in the Fish and Wildlife Service who can um, deal with you. Um, we have um, the Fish and Wildlife Service has not only the National Wildlife Refuge System, but Ecological Services, which is a branch of the Fish and Wildlife Service that deals with lands that are in private uh, ownership. Um, they can, um, they have biologists on staff that can help you develop plans or um, help you with easements. If you are in a portion of the state, which is outside of the CPA, but you, again, you just um, uh, contact us through our email on the website and we'll make sure that your question gets answered by us or by, we'll forward it to um, the party who's most appropriate to answer that question. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Matt. We've got another question for you here. Is my land on the Roanoke River in the proposed area of expansion? Alrighty. So, yeah, um, if you got a, a comment card or a, a landowner card in the mail, then yes, your property was part of the CPA. We sent an email, uh, we sent a mailing or uh, a card 
um, to every um, landowner that appeared in the CPA on the tax maps. Um, if you think that your property is in the CPA but did not get a, um, a card or um, information, uh, please comment. Uh, uh, please contact us through the email on the website, and we'll talk to you in person, and we'll try to figure out exactly where you are and determine exactly if you are part of the CPA or not. Thanks, Matt. And we'll go ahead and post that link to the project website in the chat, just in case anyone would like that information. We'll move on to our last pre-registered question before we begin answering the questions we're receiving in the chat. Our next pre-registered question is, does the boundary across Cross Devil's Gut to the south? And we'll turn that over to Jean. All right. Um, yes, the boundary does go to the south of Devil's Gut, more so on the western side of Devil's Gut as you go upstream versus the, the more eastern part of Devil's Gut as you're going downstream. So um, not sure where uh, the area you're interested in um, thinking about, but yes, uh, the boundary does go to the south of Devil's Gut. Thank you, Jean. All right, with that, we'll wait a moment as we get more questions in the chat. And I'll take a minute here to just remind folks how they can submit live questions. You can um, chat us those questions. So you'll find the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, in your Zoom toolbar. And then you can type your question into us and you'll send it to hosts and panelists. And then if we do have any phone callers on, again, I don't see any right now, but just in case, you can press star nine to raise your hand to let us know you have a question since folks um, joining by phone don't have access to that chat feature. So with that, we'll go ahead and go to our next question, which is how many cultivated acres are included in the proposed area? Alrighty, so um, regarding the number of proposed cultivated area, um, I don't have that figure right here off the top of my head. However, it is within the LPP document itself. Um, so if you want to read through the document, you can. Otherwise, because you submitted your question here in writing, it's going to become a part of the public do uh, record and we will answer that question when we develop the final draft uh, version or the final version of this proposal. So yeah, so either you can look it up in the LPP yourself or you can wait till we do the final uh, version of the LPP and we will answer your question there. Thank you, Matt. And we will go ahead and paste a link in the chat directly to the LPP so that person can access that document if they'd like. With that, we'll move to our next live question, which is, will overall level of river rise? And we'll turn that over to the service. Okay, so yeah. Um, as I mentioned during the slide presentation, um, the amount of water that we find in the lower Roanoke River um, below Roanoke Rapids Dam is based on the amount of water that's released from the Carr Lake uh, Reservoir up there um, at, at Carr Lake Dam. So um, they're authorized through their uh, enabling legislation to release a maximum of 35,000 cubic feet per second. Um, so therefore, um, the water level should never be higher than the 35,000 CFS footprint that um, they release from that dam. Um, I can't, I can't foresee any situation where there would be more water in the Roanoke than the 35,000 uh, CFS footprint that would be released from Car Lake. Thank you, Matt. Our next question is. Is acquisition of property to be on a first come first serve basis? 
when would NWS en entertain such offers? Okay, um, so yeah, you can um, you can submit your property to us um, if you have an interest in either selling your property in fee title um, or you have an interest in creating an easement on your property. You can contact us through the uh, website. Um, the uh, so it's not based on first come first serve per se. It's more of where does your property fit into the um, the floodplain of the river? Is it high priority, low priority, that kind of thing? Um, and then, so um, as far as the timing is concerned, this is only a proposal so far. Um, once we answer uh, um, all these questions from the public that we're going to receive through January the 4th, uh, we will work on the final version of our proposal of our LPPEA. Um, that will get sent up to Washington for approval. Once it gets approved in Washington um, and the boundary of our acquisition boundary of our refuge changes, then we can start um, entertaining the inquiries about purchasing easements or um, purchasing uh, fee title. Um, and we were hoping to have the final version sent to Washington um, before March of next year. Thank you, Matt. All right, we do have more questions coming in in the chat. And just a reminder, if anyone would like to look at the draft LPP EA, that is in the chat right now. You can find a link to that. So with that, we'll wait a moment as more questions come in. And again, if you'd like to ask a question, please chat those to us. And if anybody has a question and is joining us by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Thank you everyone for your patience as the questions load. All right, our next question is, how would I know if my property is in the primary CPA area or extended CPA area? Okay, uh, another great question. So um, I know it's not super obvious on the maps because the, um, the overlays that we created um, covered up the actual river itself. Um, but if you do have uh, questions about um, your property and its location in the CPA, you can send us um, like a, a screenshot of Google Earth, um, an area photo of where you are in relationship to the river. Um, and we can and you can give us a verbal description of your locations, the county and that kind of thing. Um, we'll try to get back to you and tell you exactly where you are and how, what section of the CPA you're located in, whether it's priority one, priority two, or uh, priority three. Thank you. Next question is, what is the timeline for consideration and potential approval of the expansion? You spoke to this a little bit, Matt, but is there anything you want to add? I, th I think I kind of answered the timeline. Like I said, we are accepting comments on this proposal until January the 4th. Once that comment period ends, we have to sift through all the substantive comments. Uh, we have to respond to all those comments. Perhaps um, some of those comments will make us change the way the EP LPP reads or the EA. Um, once we make all those changes, we anticipate having those changes made um, by the 1st of March, and then we will send the final version of the LPPEA up to um, Washington for approval. I can't tell you how long it will take once it gets to Washington, um, but um, once it's there, it's kind of out of our hands. Um, they, um, it's a priority for the Fish and Wildlife Service, so I'm sure they'll work on it right away. And uh, hopefully by the end of, or the fall of 
2024, we'll have uh, a final approved boundary, but I can't say for sure exactly when that will happen. Thank you, Matt. All right. We did have a question. Will new flood areas be created? Okay, so um, I'm not super sure uh, what the que uh, the questioner is asking. Um, so as sea levels rise down towards the mouth of the river, uh, we may see areas flooded down there that um, didn't flood before, uh, simply because as sea level rises and water starts to flow down the river, um, it has nowhere to go once it gets down there and it's going to spread out. Um, over over areas that are that are larger than what they currently flood typically now. Um, as far as flooding upstream from Williamston, I don't imagine that um, the flood area will change any or very drastically from when um, the the uh, Car Lake releases thirty five thousand for say five or six days. What we saw in, what year was it, Gene? Uh, 2016, 17. What we saw in 2016 and 17 is probably going to be the extent of the flooding um, upstream um, of Williamston. Now, downstream of Williamston in the next 50, 100 years. Um, but I don't anticipate that there'll be impacts um, upstream of Williamston very much. Thank you, Matt. We will go ahead and wait a moment as we have more questions loading in the chat. And we'll probably answer questions for about 10 or 15 more minutes. I know we got a little bit of a late start to the Q&A and then um, move into uh, the public comment session. So I did see a question in the chat that said, will today's slides be shared with participants? Um, we will note that the recording of the presentation, which includes the slides, uh, will be posted to the US Fish and Wildlife Service website. And then do you guys have anything to add about the slides specifically? And we might get back to you over the chat. Um, our public affairs uh, and planning expert has lost her voice today. So we'll we'll get back with you on that one. With that, we'll go to our next pre-register question or live question, excuse me. Would you please clarify the use of the term cooperative agreements in contrast to easements? We'll turn that over to you, Matt. Okay. Yeah, I'll give it my best shot. So, um, you know, a con uh, conservation easement is going to be um, a payment that is made to a landowner for a specific um, use on their ref on their property in perpetuity. Um, a cooperative agreement would be um, you, the landowner enters into an agreement with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, to manage their property in a certain way. And that management plan would be created in conjunction with the landowner and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And once the plan that was created, um, and it could, be, um, it could be a logging plan on how to harvest um, timber on their property, it could be a way to manage wetlands, it could be a bunch of different things. Um, once that plan was um, approved between the landowner and the Fish and Wildlife Service, that would be put into place. Um, the service would, pro would provide the expertise that the landowner would need um, on, on the prescription for their timber harvest or on um, imp impoundment levels of wetlands or um, timing of flooding and that kind of thing. And then the landowner would be responsible for implementing that plan. Thank you, Matt. All right, we've got some more questions coming in through the chat. Just a reminder, if 
And in case anyone's joining us by phone, if you would like to ask a question verbally, you can press star nine on your phone keypad. Um, since those calling by phone can't chat us questions. So we'll continue to look out for questions in the chat. Thank you everyone for your patience as those load. All right, our next question is, what are examples of restrictions involving an easement agreement? Okay, this is a really good question. Now, the easements are, are, are a pretty wonderful thing. They can, um, they're very specific between the landowner and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so we'll deal um, with each specific landowner on a on a separate basis. So the easement that you put on your property may be different from the easement that's on your neighbor's property based on your needs and requirements. So say if you um, if you had a section of property that you wanted to put an easement on that was bottomland forested right now, um, and you said you wanted to have that protected, you didn't want it cut at all, we could put an easement on there that would protect that, um, that timber and the easement would say there's no harvesting or cutting of trees on that easement. That would be how it works. Uh, typically, the way they would work an easement, um, a uh, forester would come out and evaluate your timber. Um, they would give you a quote of the tonnage of, say, um, the, um, the, the um, pelleted part of the, your, um, the pulpwood part of your, um, your um, timber and then give you an estimate for the value of the log, uh, saw log portion of your property. And then the easement would be based on probably on some value of that timber. Um, and that would be a one one time payment to you as the landowner. And that easement would be put into the deed and would follow that property throughout its life cycle. Um, so no matter when you sell it to anyone else, that easement would be in place. Um, you may have an easement that says, we can't cut to, you can't cut any timber, but if there's a um, a hurricane or something and there's blowdown, that you can go in there and harvest that. That might be part of the easement. You might have an easement that says, okay, we can harvest timber on our property um, as long as there's an approved uh, prescription through the Fish and Wildlife Service. You may have an easement like that. So there's lots of different kinds of easements that we can do. I know I'm talking a lot about uh, timber harvest and that kind of thing, um, because um, that's what we're looking at on the Roanoke. Um, you may have a wetland impoundment on your property and you want an easement and we would determine, say, um, the easement might say something that you, you can't affect the hydrology of that impoundment. You can't drain that impoundment, those kind of things. Um, so yeah, they're very um, varied. And of course, uh, depending on what kind of easement you have, the value of that easement changes as you as the uh, the value of what the service is going to be purchasing changes. Thank you, Matt. All right, we do have a few more questions in the chat, so we'll get to those, and then we will move into the comment uh, period later. So. We'll go ahead and wait a moment as more questions load. And then just a reminder, if anybody does want to ask a question, you can chat us those questions. All right. Our next question is, if you received a card regarding this acquisition project, but you own multiple properties, how do you know which one or ones are of interest to the project? Okay. Yeah, great, great question. So there are lots of landowners that own 
um, a lot of various parcels that are up and down um, on the river. Um, in an effort, we didn't want to send one person um, 10, um, 10 little cards because they had 10 pieces of property that are 10 lots uh, that are parcels that were in the CPA. So what we did was we, um, we just um, searched the database by name and only sent um, one card for people who had multiple properties. So um, if you do, if you are in that instance where you have multiple properties and you're wondering um, which ones are within the CPA, and which ones are not, again, uh, contact us through the website. Um, you can send us pictures of your properties and we can tell you exactly where you are in the CPA and uh, how you fit in. Great, thank you. Our next question is, will the alignment of Roanoke River be changed in order to flood or overflow to create new wetlands? And we'll turn that over to Matt. Yeah, I think uh, Jean's gonna answer this one for me. Yeah, the, the alignment of the Roanoke River will not change with this uh, proposed project. Um, that's far beyond our ability to even do. Um, we would not be changing the alignment of the, the Roanoke River. Um, I mean, we're in this for the long haul to protect the forested wetlands along the Roanoke River. So we have no intentions of rechanneling or anything to the river to create wetlands. The wetlands are there already. Now, if you're speaking impoundments, that's not our intent to start creating impoundments out there either. Uh, we're trying to keep the system as natural as possible and let the river do its thing. And then uh, I just like to add that um, the way the, the river is controlled through the flood control project are at Carr Lake, um, it doesn't flood the way it used to in the uh, back in the past. Um, prior to Car Lake Dam, um, it wasn't uncommon to have floods of a uh, hundred thousand cfs uh, cubic feet per second come down the Roanoke River. Um, those kind of floods, that amount of water, could alter the channel of the river. Um, but because the um, the current uh, dam situation on the, on the river as it exists today, um, the river is in its channel and it's not going to change in any foreseeable future. Thank you both. I uh, said we have to get back to that help. We'll go ahead and wait as we have more questions coming in. Right. And just a reminder, we'll be in the Q&A for just a bit longer and then we'll go over and move into accepting verbal comments. We do have just a few more questions to address. And a reminder, in case we have anyone new joining us, there's a lot of information in the chat you can find. We have a link to the draft LPP and EA in there. We have the commenting information and then also a link to uh, the project website. So um, do check there if you'd like to copy down any of those links and we'll post them again later. All right, we do have some more questions. One question is, my property has a building on it. Would the value of the building be considered in a purchase offer price? Yeah, so that's uh, that's an inter interesting question and one that I don't have the answer to right at this moment. Um, so we'll have to get back to you on that. Um, um, I know that typically uh, we're trying not to acquire um, properties that actually have dwellings or, or, or living spaces on them. Um, a lot of times we um, we try to divide those those um, those parcels um, so that we didn't include anyone's dwelling or buildings or anything like that. But again, I'm not sure exactly how that would work out with realty. 
So I'll have to ask our realty specialists um, how we would handle something like that. And then um, we'll get back to you with an answer. Thank you, Matt. We've got another question here. Is this connected in some way to the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, NRCS and USDA? Yes, so um, again, I'm not really familiar with those programs of USDA. Um, it's possible that we may intersect where those programs have actions that they do on the Roanoke in the CPA area. Um, but again, I don't know um, those programs per se. And so I'll have to research that and uh, we'll get back to you when we find the answer. Thank you, Matt. All right, we have two questions left in the chat, so we'll get those answered and then we will move into the public comment portion and we'll provide instructions about how folks can comment as well. All right, our next question is, can we get shape files to that we can compare with our land base? I'm sorry, Megan, can you read the question again? I was reading something. Of course. Can we get shape files so that we can compare with our land base? Um, yes, yeah, so um, at the moment there's no, um, there's no um, plan to put shared, uh, shape files out. They're very large, so they're difficult to share. Um, if you have questions about your property and how it falls into the CPA, again, you can contact us through the website and we'll be happy to walk with you on an individual basis, um, walk through all your properties and figure out how they fit into the CPA. Thank you, Matt. All right, we do have one last question and then we'll go ahead and move on to the question and answer session this evening. Thank you everyone for the questions you've submitted so far. And if you submitted a question that we didn't have an answer for yet today, we do have um, the information of the people who asked those questions. So we will uh, work on getting back to you. All right, we have one question in the chat. Um, the question is, Will the easements or select easements expand beyond a typical roadway width? I.e., will the areas along the banks expand larger than a typical roadway? And we were wondering if that individual might be able to clarify that question a little bit. Matt, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so so I'm not sure exactly. Um, um, what kind of easement he's talking about. Um, typically, the conservation easements that we're considering are um, a piece of property that is um, highlighted by the landowner for um, a potential easement. Um, it might be a roadway. It might be larger than a roadway. It might be um, a whole parcel. Um, it all depends. Are they asking about... Um, easements to access property um, that the Fish and Wildlife Service would purchase? I don't know. Thank you, Matt. We'll give it a moment and see if that individual has any follow-up questions. And then again, we will encourage folks to submit comments. If you do have um, any questions, those can be submitted as part of your uh, larger comment. So give it a moment here and then we will go ahead and move into our comment session. I'm not seeing that we have any follow-up yet. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to the public comment portion so we can ensure that we're listening to all the comments that folks might have today. And then we can definitely follow up later with the individual who asked that question in case your question wasn't answered. Next slide, please. All 
All right. So I'll now go through instructions for how you can provide your verbal public comments today. Again, this verbal public comment session, along with your comments, is being recorded as part of the official re record. As a reminder, your camera and mic control settings are restricted during this time. You will be able to talk if and when you are unmuted, so please remember to speak when prompted. The service wants to hear from all members of the public, so we'll use the following guidelines today. First, please be mindful of the length of your comment so that everyone who wants to speak has an opportunity to do so. We ask that you comment keep your comment limited to around five minutes and we will circle back to you if we have time uh, later on. We'll do our best to get through our list of individuals who selected yes or maybe to commenting when they pre-registered for today's meeting and to save some time for others to offer their comments as well, even if you didn't sign up when registering. But if you do not get the opportunity to offer your full comment today, you can submit written comments via email, and we'll provide that information again later on. Second, please be respectful of others and their viewpoints. Third, please refrain from using profanity. While passion is welcome in your comment, policy requires that we mute anyone who uses inappropriate language because we are recording this meeting and others may be live streaming. If that does happen, we'll provide a reminder before unmuting the person to try again using words acceptable to all ages. Comments will be accepted in the order that people registered. Again, if you registered before the start time of the meeting, you're on our pre-registered commenter list. This list includes those who said yes and maybe to comment. So we'll call on those folks. And if you'd no longer like to provide a comment, you can let us know in the chat or when we call on you, uh, you can just let us know verbally. So when it is your turn to provide your comment, we'll read your name aloud from the list and we'll display your name on the screen. We'll also display the name of the commenter who is next in line. When you hear your name called out, please use the raise hand feature so that we know you are available and ready to offer your comment. You can access the raise hand feature by clicking on either the reactions icon or the participants list icon, which are both located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Again, if you wave your mouse back and forth across the bottom of your Zoom screen, the icon should appear. Sometimes the toolbar goes to the top of your Zoom screen, so if the bottom isn't working, you can check there too. You may need to exit out of your full screen view in Zoom to see those icons, but then you can select the raise hand feature located again, either in the reactions icon or the bottom of your participants list. Or if we have anyone calling in through the phone who'd like to provide a comment, again, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Once you've raised your hand, we'll unmute you so that you can provide your comment. You may be double muted, if that is the case, we'll prompt you to unmute yourself on your end so that we can hear you. If that does happen, there would be a little pop-up that says, the host has asked you to unmute. We ask that you please spell out your first and last name for the record before providing your verbal public comment. And if you are representing an organization or group, please say so during your comment. After you've provided your comment, we'll mute you and move on to the next commenter. Once we've worked our way through our list of pre-registered commenters, we'll move on to those who might have registered after the start time of today's meeting and selected that they wanted to offer a comment. And then if we have time remaining after that, we'll open the verbal public comment portion of today's meeting to anyone who would like to offer a comment today who has not already done so. Next slide, please. So just as a refresher on the screen here, um, on the left, you can see the reactions icon I was talking about. That's one way to find the raise hand. And on the right, you can see the participants list icon. And that's the other way to find the raise hand. I'll pause a moment and just let folks look at this.
All right, with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Our first pre-registered commenter who indicated they might want to offer a comment today is Virginia Wasserberg. Virginia, if you're on today and you'd like to provide a comment, please access that raise hand feature. I don't see Virginia in our participants list, so we'll circle back to them later on and move on to our next individual who selected they might want to provide a comment, Mariel Parker. Mariel, if you'd like to provide a comment, feel free to raise your hand, or if you'd rather submit written comments, you can let us know in the chat. We'll give it a moment here as I do see them in our participants list. Okay, perfect. I will unmute you now. Hi there, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Of course. Uh, yeah, you... Most of my uh, questions were answered. I'm sorry, you wanted me to spell my name? Is that correct? That would be great if you don't mind. Sure. It's M-E-R-I-E-L Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R. And yes, I think primarily most of my questions were answered uh, specifically around the uh, cooperative opportunities. So I look forward to following up uh, as directed during today's call. I might just add that I, I am quite pleased that our community has an opportunity to join a proactive conservation effort in this area. And so I do hope that um, the communities that are affected have the opportunity to maybe uh, consider something larger in scope, uh, looking at the uh, contributions by the landowners that are uh, potentially going to be involved. And I thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. We'll place you back on mute and lower your hand and move on to our next individual who said they might like to comment today. And that is Judith Newberry. I don't see that we have Judith in our participants list right now, but we'll circle back and see if they join later on. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next person who said they might like to comment, which is Henry Sansing. I don't see Henry in our participants list. We'll give it a moment here. Um, and then again, we'll circle back to see if anyone joins us later on. We know it's a Friday and folks might have other commitments and, and join us a bit later, so. With that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next person who said they might like to comment, Charlie Moyer. Charlie, I see you in our participants list. If you'd like to provide a comment, feel free to raise your hand. And if you'd rather submit those in writing, um, you can just come on and let us know as well. All right, not seeing a hand raised from Charlie. I'll go ahead and move on to our next commenter. Charlie, if you are having problems with the raise hand feature, just send us a chat and we'll get you some technical support. Okay, our next commenter is Charles Pierce. I don't see Charles in our participants list. So again, we'll note uh, to see if they join later later on. All right. Next person who indicated they might like to comment is Winford Hill. Again, I don't see Winford in our participants list. So we'll make a note and circle back to them. Last but not least, our uh, next person who indicated they might like to comment is John Whitehurst. I don't see that we have a John Whitehurst on with us today. So we'll go ahead and circle back to them again. And I'll go ahead and check my Zoom account quickly and see if anyone else signed up to comment. And then if not, we'll move on to uh, accepting comments from anyone who would like to provide a comment, regardless of whether you checked that box uh, to comment. 
All right. With that, we'll go ahead and open it up. So if anyone would like <clears throat> to provide a comment, you can go ahead and raise your hand. Again, you can find that raise hand button in the reactions icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen or the participants list. Um, there should just be a raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. But if anyone's having trouble finding that, uh, let us know in the chat and we will get you some support. And then again, I don't see any phone callers, but just in case, if you wanna provide a comment and you're joining us by phone, you would press star nine on your phone keypad. We will go ahead and continue to keep an eye out to see if we have any hands raised. And any information will be helpful in the process. So don't be shy, feel free to provide a comment, but if you'd rather submit one in writing, we will provide that information of how you can do that as well. All right, while we're waiting for uh, any hands raised for folks to provide comments, we'll go ahead and paste the information in the chat of how you can uh, submit your comments electronically after today. As a reminder, you can submit your comments through January 4th, 2024, and you'll email, email those uh, comments. I actually realize that we are missing the email on the screen, so we'll go ahead and get that added, please. And we'll also paste that information in the chat. All right. And while we are waiting for hands raised, uh, we did have one question that we wanted to revisit that we thought we might have some more things to add. That question was, um, my property has a building on it. Would the value of the building be considered in a purchase offer price? Matt? Yeah, so um, um, we were discussing this uh, question, Gene and I, amongst ourselves, and um, um, the service provides a uh, fair market value estimate for any properties that we wish to acquire. Um, and so, yes, if you have a building on your property, um, it would be assessed as part of the fair market value for that parcel. And so the value of that building would be added um, to the um appraised value and thus we would we would give you an offer based on the fair market uh, appraisal of that property so yeah the building would be included okay thank you matt for clarifying glad we were able to tie up that question so as a reminder just in case we have anyone new joining us we're currently in the comment portion of the meeting today and for the remainder of the meeting until uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be ready to listen to any comments you might have. So if you would like to comment, please access that raise hand feature. Those instructions are up on the screen, but if anyone's having any trouble finding them, just let us know. Um, 
and we'll go ahead and keep an eye out to see if we have anyone new join us who might like to provide a comment. Thank you. All right, I don't see that we have any hands raised at the moment, but just a reminder, we are here to listen to your comments today. So if anyone would like to provide a comment, please feel free to do so. You can provide those comments verbally today, or if you'd like, you can submit written comments via email.
All right, I do see that we have a hand raised from Michael Davis. I'll go ahead and unmute you now, Michael. Hi there, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. I was uh, I had lost you because it said that you were mu muted. So I was just raising my hand to say that you were on mute. Oh, no worries. Um, yeah, we're just in the, the comment phase right now. So we're just here to listen. Um, and we don't have anything to present, but would you like to provide a comment today? Uh, no, it's just been very informative. I appreciate oh. what you're doing. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. All right, just in case we have anyone new joining us, we are in the public comment portion of today's meeting and we'll be on for the next 15 minutes or so ready to listen to your comments before we go ahead and provide some closing remarks. Uh, so if anyone would like to provide a comment, we really encourage you to do so. You can let us know you'd like to comment by raising your hand and those instructions are up on the screen for how to raise your hand. And then if you'd prefer to submit comments in writing, we do have that email um, up on the screen now of where you can submit those comments before January 4th, 2024. Thanks everyone.
All right, we do have some folks still on with us. If anyone would like to provide a comment, we'll be accepting comment for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll do some closing remarks.
All right, folks, we have five minutes left in our public comment portion for today. So if anyone would like to provide a comment, please raise your hand to let us know you'd like to comment. We'll leave the screen up for the next five minutes and then we'll move into some closing remarks. Thank you. All right, folks, just a few minutes left here. If anyone would like to provide a comment, feel free to do so. We'll be ready to uh, listen to anything you have to say. And if not, feel free to submit those comments in writing. Again, the end date to submit comments is January 4th. And we will go ahead and close out the meeting in a few moments here. All right, we'll go ahead and move to the next slide and close out the meeting. So I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but we really do encourage you to submit any comments you have. You can submit those via email to River at fws.gov. Those can be submitted on or before January 4th, 2024. And then for more information about the project, you'll visit that link up on the screen. We'll put that in the chat as well. And that'll be where you can find the draft LPP and EA. You can also find an FAQ sheet there and then copies of each uh, map for the alternatives. So we'll go ahead and put that uh, link in the chat. We do have that comment information in the chat if anyone would like to copy it down. And with that, I'd just like to say on behalf of the service that we thank everyone for attending, asking questions and providing comments. 
We appreciate everyone taking time out of their Friday to participate in this public comment process, and we look forward to receiving your input. Thank you all, and have a great weekend.